Guys, before we start this episode, we are doing our muscle egg giveaway, which you'll see us do it live at the end of this show. But this week's giveaway is for Freedom in Motion 777 on Instagram. Now, if you want to be entered for next week to win a full jug of muscle egg, please leave a comment in this video below and Ashley will pick one the following week. Yes. Randomly with my eyes closed, Randomly like I did with, with this one. <laughs> Thanks so much. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Hello guys, welcome to another episode of Bikini and the Brain. I'm here with the lovely Ashley. That's what they call me around here. Yeah, they do. We Ashley. call you lovely, lovely Ashley. And you are, I love your outfit again. You know, I try to match. Monochromatic again. I spilled beverage all over my pants. Looks like I peed myself, but <laughs> I would say you won the best outfit today. I'm wearing my flamingo shirt. I love your flamingos. You know where I got this flamingo shirt at? Forever 21? Flamingos Casino. Really? <laughs> yeah, they serve like that 20 bucks. Sense. Yeah, yeah. I, like I was it. there and I was like, I need this. And I thought about our podcast, so, I, so hopefully you appreciate it. I'm glad I you do. appreciate it. Yeah. I like that a lot. It's switching it up. I like the ish a lot. It's my style. You know, it's still black. Too bad we don't have the green screen. We can have like flamingo oh. settings and it can be with your flamingos and all that. Tip to you and maybe for Hugo to take you. But they have actual, and for everyone watching, they have actual live flamingos at Flamingos Casino. Really? There's like 20 of them. Yeah, I walked in their little lobby thing or in the back and there's fl fl flamingos. It's crazy. Oh. I didn't know that. Isn't it cool? Yeah. Damn. There's so much stuff here in Vegas <laughs> that we haven't figured out yet. So, um, speaking of not figured it out yet, our listeners have asked us questions. Yes, they have. They <laughs> asked questions, and we are here to answer them. We love doing these viewer Q&As. I think they're so much fun because... People get excited when they hear the question. Yeah. <laughs> but also, it's just like, you know, I want to know what you guys want to know about, so it's helpful for us to kind of dive right into that. Oh, that was your, that, usually that's my line. That's good. Diving in. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But going into, going into, before we go into the questions, anything new with you, Ashley? I know you're, I think people want to know. You're looking pretty capped off, you know? I work out. You're working out? So, I work out. So, I don't know if you guys knew this, um, <laughs> but I, I work out. I do. She works out and she is, <laughs> she is um, kind of semi, maybe, yes, kind of, yes, prepping right now. For oh, yes. Definitely prepping. Oh, I'll say it. I'm probably going to do the clash. Oh, yeah. okay. I didn't know I was going to do this. No, no, no. It's no secret here. I don't want to okay. say I'm 100% sure I didn't turn in my contract yet, but I'm pretty, like, sure. But not 100% sure, like 90% okay. sure. That's pretty big for you to throw that out there. Yeah, no, I'm not, yeah, okay. I'm not one of those people that like hide it. Yeah. But I also don't want to say it's like a set in stone thing because, I mean, I got another week to decide. So by the time they're listening, Friday, um, to decide if I want to do the show or not. It's just been a struggle this year, as you know, kind of, I don't want to say struggle, but to go 100% intensity has been hard. I don't know. My sleep has been off, but... I'm getting there, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm re like I say, I'm really good at staying like 95% intensity through the whole year. You're like, you're not going to see me blow up. You're not going to see me slack. But to go that extra mile where it's just like, I look forward to cardio. Give it to me. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> and then a workout after that. Yeah, let's do it. And then I'm like, you know that feeling. Yeah. I think we talked about it in pre like pre-prep. But that feeling of like totally in the zone. But I'm, I'm creeping in that. I'm yeah. creeping in the zone. So, yeah, I'm like ninety eight percent now. <laughs> yeah, we did. So we did some posing today. Ashley looks really good. So we'll see. We'll see what the next week brings. So we shall see. Stay tuned. Yeah. All right. So let's jump now. Let's go. Yeah, ahead. let's do that. Let's, <laughs> let's dive right in. Like dive right flamingo. Out. Yeah, I was gonna sit like a flamingo. Do they dive? I don't know. They probably get food by diving from the I air. I keep right? looking at them. Though. No, they're tall. They probably don't fly very much. I don't think so. I don't. They think probably they fly like just at all. yeah. Okay, let's. They beaks. just like show off their legs. Yeah. And they bend. <laughs> they bend hyper extension. Yes. <laughs> you could trade some flamingos. They have some skinny legs. Yes. Anyway, enough about the flamingos. Yes. <laughs> we got way too far into that. <laughs> yes. We're here to answer your questions, guys. So, first question. First steps on getting started in bikini, which could apply to also figure or any division. Yeah. What are the first steps? And I'll start off by saying, before you hire a coach, before you start dieting, before you start training, do your research. Yeah. Do it. YouTube's a great source. Like, yeah, these days especially. Like your channel, my channel, you know what I'm saying? Anyone's channel. <laughs> yeah. You get a lot of good information. There's a lot of good information out there right now. So I would say first steps on getting started in bikini means that if you're even thinking about that, that means that you're already working out. Okay, so 
I'm going to go into real quickly the like the phases of bikini, which is or of competing. Well, bikini competing, I guess I'd say. So the phase number one, people just start working out, right? For this initial phase of working out, we call it just bodybuilding, right? So you're building your body and you're pretty much doing things how an average person would do things. You have a normal split. You still might you might even be training pecs. You know, you might be just be that's something you don't do in like advanced training for bikini. But you might just be training your total body, you know, everything, and you're on a normal bodybuilding split. So you have your bodybuilding, and then you're like just getting fit, you know, you're just getting used to it, you're getting in the zone, getting regular, and then you're like, okay, now I wanna do like my full on, I wanna do a competition eventually. Like I wanna start, so now you're being more focused. So now you're doing your bikini bodybuilding, right? So instead of just bodybuilding and you're like doing everything, you know, maybe you're doing squats and deadlifts and chest exercise, or whatever, then you're like, okay, now I'm gonna do my workouts more focused or what bikini is. So you drop the chest, you drop movements that might be making your waistline a little thicker, you go more more volume towards the muscle groups that you wanna work, like your glutes, your shoulders, your hamstrings, things like that. Maybe ease off the quads, no chest, whatever. And that's bikini bodybuilding. And then you're like, okay, now I'm doing really good, I wanna do bikini sculpting, right? Which is where you get to like Ashley's level and you're just working on parts of the body now. You're just trying to, so once you start going into those structured routines is make sure that you are make sure that your plan is there in terms of your workout and then from your workout so that's like the bikini phases right but really all it takes is like someone coming into the gym saying even if it's your day one and you're like i want to be a bikini athlete you can skip that initial bodybuilding phase and just go right into like bikini building phase so just make sure that your actions meet up with your meet up with your goal and that your watching the YouTube videos, like what YouTube, do you have any like specific YouTube videos you'd recommend for someone who's like new? Um, my channel, your channel? <laughs> <laughs> no, but for real. Um, the NPC News Online, yeah. they, they have a great YouTube channel. They post all the shows so you can see how they're posing, how they're looking, and also their website, npcnewsonline.com would be where you find the shows to do. But I mean, yeah, going to different channels and just making sure that they're recent you can get some good information, but uh, to, to bridge the gap from not knowing how to train to training these specific body parts, I think it's important that you have a good coach. You got to hire a good coach, unless you are um, a coach yourself, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that doesn't really apply to this situation. So you got to find yourself a good coach. Like, Let's say an Adam Bonia, for example, one of those one of those types. <laughs> there's a lot of those types out there. One of those there's, types. There's a there's a lot of those types <laughs> out there. Yeah. So yeah, I guess I guess so. The initial in the initial phases of bikini. If I was brand new to the sport and wanted to do a bikini show, I would I would work out every workout with intention. That's the thing. Is like you know that's just my style too. Is like anytime I do anything, I don't I can't do it. Like even I wish I could do something fifty percent. I just can't. Like physically, I just have to give it my all. Like I just don't know any other way and it kind of consumes me. So if you want to be good at this sport, it does need to be like all in. So I would start at the very beginning and just be like, okay, I'm working out. I want to look like whatever, like an Ashley, like a whoever. And I need to focus on this type of workouts. I'd get a physique assessment. Um, so you can do a physique assessment. There's a lot of different coaches that do physique assessments. I do them off the website too, or I'll look at your physique and say, hey, you need to work on this more, that more whatever, and kind of give you a breakdown of where you're lagging, where you need more, where you need less. Or even if you're, uh, yeah, I guess that would be kind of an initial phase. And then start studying the sport, start studying the posing, studying the look that you want, posing routines, suits, all that. So, yeah. yeah. Good stuff. It's good to have a, that extra eye to tell you because sometimes you're, you know, in your, you have your own biases, but, you know, somebody else's eye is going to tell you something differently than what you think of yourself. So yeah. very important from that aspect as well. But uh, this question here is very similar, or I guess just rolls on to this question. So I'm going to go ahead and ask. Let's see. What to expect in a first-time bikini prep? Whoop, whoop, yeah. whoop. You know what? I can remember my first few bikini preps. And for some reason, the diets were so much more miserable to me. Like, so miserable. Like, I really had brain fog so badly when I did, like, a low-carb diet or carbs cycling stuff. And I find, like, I don't have that anymore. I used to have the worst cravings back then, but now I don't. It's, like, crazy. It's almost like my body's accepted it. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? And I have new taste buds. But I just, just remember being kind of miserable in the diet department. I was just, like, so hungry, and I was craving, and I was, like, lethargic, and... I was like stupid, <laughs> even more stupid than I am now. 
that's a joke. But um, for real, like I really had like brain fog. I don't know. Yeah. So it took me some getting used to. I don't have that anymore. I don't really get hungry too often. Um, cravings are at bay, and I'm loving it. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, I would say the adjustment. Here's I, and here's the problem you run into. And I'm so here. I gotta be kind of sensitive about it. When I prep people, I will always try to give them the most amount of calories and the least amount of cardio. That's always the goal. Get someone in shape with the most amount of calories, the least amount of cardio. But at the same time, you gotta be realistic of what you're trying to do, right? There, it's, there's a point where your body just doesn't wanna get that lean. Now, maybe you're one of those people who won't reach that point because you just naturally are lean. Maybe body fat just falls off of you pretty easily. There's people out there like that. I have three clients right now who are off season who are nearing 4,000 calories, if not past it, maybe a couple might be past it, not doing any cardio still with a six pack. It's crazy, you know? I've, I've and, and it is not an age thing. I have uh, two of them are over 35. One's like in her 20s. And uh, yeah, so maybe you're that person and you hear about those stories and you're like, oh, I wanna do it like that girl, like her. Well, everyone wants to do it like that girl. You might not be that girl. Like that's just the reality of things. You know, I have clients that are, it doesn't even make sense sometimes. I have, I had one guy who was like, he was eating so many calories and always had abs. You remember him, um, Jeff, the, the, the Russian kid, oh, um, yeah. the tall blonde one, super good looking guy. He, he turned pro and like literally to get food in him, he would be eating, like I don't recommend this, but we were trying to get him over 7,000 calories and he just have Snicker bars in his pocket all day. And he'd be like, yeah. They didn't just, melt? He just eat them all the time. He'd just be in the office for like, maybe 40 minutes just like hanging out and he'd probably eat two of them. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, I can't eat all that food. Like I can't eat all the rice. I can't eat all, I have to do this to get like 7,000, 8,000 calories. It's crazy. And he had abs all the time. He had ab veins. It's crazy. I'm like, you know what? It's for you. It works. Like Those just grocery bills though. Oh man. Well, that's why he was doing Snickers and stuff. He's like, I just, he's like, I drink full Cokes, like Coke, like oh. Coca-Cola's. Like I was talking to, um, uh, Martin, who was here the other day too, the pro bodybuilder. And he was saying that it's like, I drink full Cokes cause I can't eat the volume of Right, right. So you have those people who like have to eat that much, and then you like try to say to yourself, "I want to do my prep like that." I want to do my prep like that too. I would love to do. I would love. I don't have that type of metabolism. So you got to understand, it's going to be different for every person, and for some of you, for a large majority of you, it's going to suck. So if you only focus on the ten percent of people in the world, or even less than that, who can do these crazy preps and they just macro diet their way there, and they're having pizzas and this and that, you got to understand. That is not the most majority of people. So just go into it knowing, hey, this is gonna be the hardest thing I probably ever do. It's the only sport that's going to take this much effort out of me than any other sport. You know, I played hockey for years and it never took this much effort like to do that sport because you could eat whatever you want. You just go to practice and you practice a couple hours a day and you work out in the gym an hour a day and that's it, three hours, right? You're done. Prep. It's morning to night, no mess ups on your diet, and then you work out for an hour, hour and a half, whatever. So just know that going into it, you're not supposed to look like that. You're not supposed to be really lean and really muscular at the same time. You know, so it's gonna be uncomfortable, and there's no one who's ever won a Miss Olympia who didn't reach some level of pretty high discomfort. You know, so mm -hmm. you're gonna have to. Because if it were easy, everyone would do it, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. And if you're, you know, and so that's one thing I would say. And then, um, yeah, so that, and going into your first bikini prep, be, just be mentally prepared in any prep, men's physique, whatever. Be mentally prepared for, and be ready, and be realistic, I guess I would say. Yes, absolutely. Don't set your expectations too high, especially on your first show. I think that's why, that's probably where we see the most drop off, is like somebody oh, yeah. has these expectations in their mind that they're going to win, they're going to kill it, they're going to look so much better than everyone else. And then they go into the show, and if they don't win, they're like, this is stupid, I hate this, this politics, the, the yeah. judge, because they know that the judge knows that girl and the coach, and the, you know, and it's and it's like, it's a shame, because if you would have just kind of been a little bit more realistic, and um, you probably wouldn't have that mental outcome of, like, fury, of, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Disappointment. Because <laughs> just, you know, it sets you up for disappointment when you only expect to win. And in reality, in your first competition, your first prep, like, it, it, sometimes it takes a few shows to get your groove. Like, for example, it took me a few shows to find, oh, green suit works good for me. I was wearing, like, this Target suit. <laughs> it, it took me a while, like, to get it and to get the posing and to get the physique right. So, you know, can you win your first show? Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's been done before, of course. But is it likely? Probably not. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't keep trying and keep going. Because, you know, regardless if it's your first show or your second show or your 18th show, somewhere along the line, you're going to lose at some point. Okay? Even all the girls on the Olympic stage obviously have lost at one point, you know? And more than once. Yeah. <laughs> so even applying it to, like, an amateur, it, the same thing goes. You don't expect to win every show. And especially your first show, it might take you a while to get the hang of it, to get how it works, what works best for you. Yeah. I mean, you could look at, there's some cool stories out there. I mean, Janet, what did she, was she in seven Olympias? And always they played second in probably four of them? More than that, I'm sure. I mean, she was like the most, she's definitely the most second place winner. Mm -hmm. And she stuck with it, got it. Yeah, she finally if you look got at, it. I know, right? And then you look at like Issa, who got, the year she won her Olympia, she got fourth in Japan. Like, it's never going to go just... Oh, you just keep winning and winning and winning. You know what yeah, I mean? It just in doesn't. Perfect world. It doesn't work that way, you know, in any in any sport. And so I think that that is the biggest, the biggest drop off is exactly that. Yeah. A girl doesn't do great in her first show. Her coach says it's politics because she trains with Adam, right? And then, and then, and then they then she doesn't do it because the sport's corrupt, right? So just to throw it out there, guys, there is zero political pull, <laughs> and the coaches, the the coach, the the judges don't know who's coached by who. Yeah. Like. Like maybe at the level of like me and Ashley because we're so public and everyone knows, but it's but it's no pool. All the girls at the top, the judges know their coach. Like if it's not any pool, it doesn't matter. Like you're just a body up there. They don't even care who you are. Yeah, just, they're going so fast. They're trying to write down numbers so fast. They're not they're not worried about who's your coach. Yeah, you know what I mean. There's it, no. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not to sound mean, but they don't care. Like they're not <laughs> stalking your social media. Yeah. Most of <laughs> these. Who who does they who do they train with? Yeah, <laughs> most like, of these judges are still just getting on social yeah, media. Yeah, like, aren't even on there. So, yeah. I mean, it's just like, it's ridiculous. So, <laughs> I mean, don't use that as an excuse. And I know your family and your friends are going to tell you, you should have won. Oh, you, you look the best up there. You should have won. But that's a very biased opinion. Everyone's parents say that. You could literally look the worst <laughs> yeah. person up there. Yeah. And they'll still say you should have won. I think I, I, there's so many of the, because the judges, a lot of them are like, you know, they've been doing this for 30 plus years. They're like over 50 and they're like not even on really social media. It's so mm -hmm. funny. I mean, Sandy lately has been getting on more social media and like just recently. And then she's like, I'm still trying to figure this thing out. And I'm like, that just tells you right there. Like she just started mm -hmm. like, you know, this last year maybe because of, probably because of lockdowns and she kind of had to, right? But just so you guys know, it's not a, if, if a coach is telling you that ever, it's never that's never the case i wish it was the case i would love that i'd be like hey i'm here give my girl championship let's this is much easier the, the reality is in anything in anything in the life if you go to someone who's been doing something for you know 20 years 15 years they're likely going to be better than the guy who's been doing it for a year that's just the reality of anything like i if you hit baseballs against a guy who's been practicing hitting baseballs for 20 years like, and you've only just started a year ago. Yeah, he's going to be better at hitting baseball. So that's like, it's just anything in life. So if when you get these like super, super seasoned guys who everyone knows, it looks a little fishy, but you got to remember they have a recipe that's been working for them for 20 years and they put out better athletes because they, because of that, because of their eye, because they're trained better, whatever. And you have your guys that are like, they get it faster than others. But for the most part, it's like the experienced guys. Yeah, they put out better athletes. That's, sorry, that's just the way it is. You know, they have a better eye. They're more experienced. They should be better. A chef doing it for 20 years is usually better than a chef doing it for one year. Usually, mm -hmm. not always. So mm -hmm. yeah. there you go. So transitioning into the next question, um, somebody asked on your Instagram, why is judging different in the MPC versus the Pro League, the IFBB Pro League? Yeah. So talent, talent pool is, Literally is much deeper in the professional league, um, obviously, because you had to be good to get there, right? So when you're comparing like all the best bodies, um, the judging will be a little bit different than if you're comparing like some uh, local competitors. There might be some good ones in there. There might be some that actually look like they might look more like a pro body, but in comparison to the amateur bodies, they're gonna look drastically different. Oh yeah. But that, I don't even like to use that excuse a lot because there's a certain shape. Even though you, like for example, if you're at an amateur show and you're a bikini competitor and you have a lot more muscle than these other amateur competitors, and maybe you look similar to a pro, uh, just because you have more muscle doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna look better though. It's about shape, balance, flow, all these factors. But I think like for people that don't attend the shows and they just see pictures, 
that can be very deceiving sometimes if they don't see the whole routine and they don't see everyone who competed against them. Yeah. You know, even I can look too small or too muscular compared to some of the pros. Depends on who you put me with. Yeah. And that really, honestly, that really is the only thing. It's just who shows up. Yeah. You know, you got to understand when you have, when you have, you got to understand how many levels up that is. That's a, there's levels to this game. You know, there's a lot of levels to this game and people don't understand that. So yeah, of course, when you look at level one compared to level 10, totally different physique because you got to understand when you have a local show, you have so many different types there. And I support all the types that go there. I, I love when someone, and honestly, one of my favorite things to do is take someone who's like regular, who isn't that, you know, perfect physique, pro, whatever, and then turn them into their, their first show body where they're super happy and they transform because you could like change their life, right? And I love that part about doing this job. So you have your people who are just want to get on stage one time and just transform and have that picture and say they did it, right? Fully support that. I, I actually love that. So you have that person. And then you have your Ashley before she went pro type who's like, one day I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push as hard as I can. One day I'm going to... You never even thought you're going to be Miss Olympia, but no, like <laughs> one, day, one day I want to push, I want to go pro, right? That's kind of the attitude, right? So you have two different types that are there. So who do you think is going to look better out of those two types? Yeah, probably the Ashley type who is, has a good genetic structure, who wants to go pro, who's putting everything she can into it, and then versus the girl who's been working out for six months who just wants to step on stage. So you have those two types showing up at the same show. If you have one girl show up like, let's say, Ashley looking like she's going to look in two weeks at a local show where there's nine girls who are soft and there's some that are like pretty decent shape, Ashley might not even win that show because she might be too muscular and too lean comparatively to those nine other girls because the standard is different. Right, and like a stick out like a sore thumb. Exactly, right? And so now Ashley goes and competes as a pro and all the pros look like that. Well, now it's really hard because no one really sticks out that much at all. I mean, pro judging is so hard with oh, bikini. Yeah. It's like you can, you, you, you can pretty much take any pro show that's a decent size show take to top the top three of them and then just flip them around and no one would argue with you be like oh first gets third today and second gets first today whatever like you could just and no one would be like oh that's crazy why do they do that they're just going to be like oh yeah that makes sense it's, they all look you can have an argument for all of them so the really is the talent pool um and and how the girls show up now as a pro level there's a standard of how people show up at a local level the standard kind of is that pro look where everyone would want to look like that but no one's there yet you got it they're on first base you know the pro level they're they're on they're on they're, they're at home you know so it's that's the difference it's just who shows up mm -hmm. cool well the next question is how to defeat stage nerves and you know what i still deal with this a little bit i'll be honest like i still get nervous no matter what show it is whether it be the olympia or just um a random pro show it's, it's like the same. I get, I get a little bit nervous, but you know, I always like to, to think that, um, it's kind of good to be a little bit nervous because it shows you care, right? Because if you didn't care, you'd just be like, whatever, let's get this over with. Like, I'm not nervous, <laughs> you know? But it shows I care, you know? Things you care about, you get a little bit nervous. And that's fine. Um, I try to picture in my head, like, to turn that nervous energy into, like, positive, fun energy to show I want to be there because nothing's, more unattractive than somebody that just looks like they want to get off stage and eat a cheeseburger, you know? It's it's nice to have, like, somebody that looks like, wow, they're really having fun doing what they do on stage and all that. So it's like you got to kind of convert the nerves into that fun, positive energy. And easier said than done. Like I said, I still deal with it. But if anything, you know, I try to think of that. And I also try to think of, too, sometimes if we're nervous, it's because we feel like we have the weight of the world on our shoulders oh, my boyfriend's watching, or oh, my coach is going to be disappointed. Oh, my family's watching. What will they think? I don't want to, you know? And at some point, you got to almost, it sounds bad, but say it's not that serious. Like, the world's not going to end yeah. if I don't win. Um, and it's I'm putting more pressure on myself than what's necessary. And just have fun with it. Because at the end of the day, you're still going to go home. You're still going to come home to a family who loves you. Nothing's going to change. You're still going to have an awesome life. And you go back to training and... Hopefully next time you win, you get back to the drawing board. So yeah, I always there's a there's a story I tell people who get nervous. So one same thing. There's levels to this as well. So I have to I generally I have to speak in front of a good amount of people pretty frequently, 
that always freaked me out. But because I started with like real small groups and then worked my way up. And then I think the last one I did like a Zoom call it was like over, I know that, I don't know how many total people were on it, but there was like 3000 people in the company that could have attended. But it's like, you just get used to just, you just level up, right? You just, okay, first it was five people. Now it's whatever people. Now it's 3000, right? So just like that, if you need to, if you're, if you're one of those people who need to, I would recommend coming to posing classes, like group classes. If you can go to group classes and get comfortable in a group setting, then that's like, you know, that's your initial 10 people. You get some nerves out and then maybe do your small show locally. Even if you're not in like a hundred percent your best shape, but it's like a small show. Maybe it's like one of these like little one-off shows and you're just like, I'm just going to do it. And then just help you with my nerves. Like do that and like kind of level up. But there's this, uh, there was a show, um, there was a show, it was years ago in Colorado and a girl actually fell like, and everyone's like always afraid they're going to fall. They're going to fall. Right. So I use her as an example because she fell. It didn't affect her place. And there was actually like stairs to go up to the stage and she tripped on the stairs and like, she fell like real briefly. She fell like hit her knee hands and then got up. And it was like, the audience was like, Oh, right. So, you know, she was a mess when she was on stage. She still did a decent posing routine. You can tell it messed with her a little bit and it didn't affect her placing. And then I always tell the girls who are like nervous about falling or just nervous period. I'm like, do you remember that? Did you ever hear about that girl who fell on stage at that whatever show? It was a, it was actually, it was a long time. It was called the warrior, the show, because it had stairs on it. And they were like, no, who was she? And I was like, exactly. I don't know who she is. And I was there. You don't know who she was. But if it was the end of the world, it would be all over everything. Everyone would know. You would know about it for sure. It was local like to, at that time. And that just tells to show you like, no one really cares. Like if you fall, if something happens, if you're not your best, no one really cares. People remember at that show who wins the show. You know, people remember the excellence. They don't remember if you messed up your posing routine. They don't remember if you placed fourth because you carb loaded way too much. Like it's, that's a you thing, you know, you'll remember and that's it. Just like anything else, like, if you don't, you don't remember anyone who messed up at anything, like, unless it was like catastrophe, right? This girl fell on stage. No one remembers. Like, and that's probably as worse as it can get in bodybuilding, you know? Mm -hmm. So there you go. That's a good point, Adam. Yeah. I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would be considered too muscular for bikini? So in bikini, you know, there's a limit, obviously. That's why they have divisions. Otherwise, bikini competitors would be bodybuilders, right? Yeah. So there are limits um, between each division and you... You know, you can kind of, I think we sometimes we, what, what would you call it? Hover on, on play, play with the line yeah. a little bit, but not to cross it. So in bikini, ideally, um, they don't want to see a lot of quads. I noticed so they don't want to see quad separation, which I don't really have. So I don't worry about that so much. But what I do worry about is my abs can get a little crispy, a little crispy, and I don't train them. Um, so... That's one thing that I guess is not my best quality is <laughs> like my abs get a little too lean. Um, but other things I guess that would be frowned upon in bikini would be like anything that's with striations, no veins. Like we're supposed to be, I guess, fitness cover models in a way, right? Yeah. So we don't want to be like, like looking like we're like, yeah. you know, <laughs> like she hulks or whatever. So we kind of have to still keep that, you know, athletic toned look, but more of like in a pageanty type of way. Yeah, I think Makes that's sense. a good, I think it's a good, it's, a, it's, there's no way to clearly define it, I would mm -hmm. say. Like you can, you'll see in pictures, like when a girl went too far and she got too muscular, but even then it's pretty hard to like define, define it, you know, and it's on, honestly, it's honestly per girl too. Like you can look at some of the more athletic types out there. Ashley's one of the more athletic, more muscular types. Um, you could look at only like, if I nail that prep. <laughs> yeah, you could look at like like Jennifer Dory. She's one of those more athletic, more muscular types. Laura Lee has a lot of muscle on her too. Um, God, there's I mean Angelica even has a lot of muscle on her too. So if you took like that, let's say you took like Jennifer's muscle and you put it on Janet's frame, like she would be she would be too muscular for her frame, right? And so every you have to find the appropriate amount of muscle per structure for the girl. And that could be, that could vary so much, you know, Anya can hold a good amount of muscle without looking too crazy, but she's got a decent frame, right? So I, a lot of it comes down to like what your frame is, what the judges want from you. And the judges seem to want something specific when you get to the higher ranks, like per girl too. So as an amateur judges feedback, I would say is a lot less important because you're just trying to get into the game, you know, and it's just, it's a lot, a little less critical. 
but you, you can't be too muscular, of course. That's clear to see. Um, but at the pro level, it's like really what they like on that particular frame. And there's a lot of, it's really molded by, by what they want to see from that particular person. So I'd say get judges feedback, especially as you're, if you're at the national level, if you're at the pro level, and then if you're at the amateur level, just try to not go too far with it. And it's a little bit more forgiving at that level and, and try new things. Try what looks best for you. Try coming in too hard and see if it looks good on your physique. Try coming in a little softer. See if it looks good on your physique. It's going to be different. And that's when you see like the top 10 of the Olympia, there's quite a big variance in conditioning and quite a big variance in, in how much muscle they have too, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I, that's why I love bikini. It's like so artistic, you know? Right. It's, yes. it's such an artistic division. It's so right. fun. But I will say with everything that you just said, if somebody should look at you and be able to tell you're a bikini competitor, not figure. Yeah. That's a big thing. You know, you, you shouldn't be like questioning like, is she figure? Or she bikini, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, so if you even have to question it, you're probably too muscular. Yeah, a couple of things you can clearly see right away. If your quads at the bottom are squared off, if you're like where the bottom of your quad looks like a rectangle instead of like a nice taper to the knee and it pops out, that's a figure quad. Um, if the shoulders are way too crazy and too wide and you just, it's obvious when you see it. Um, is there any other like obvious ones that are like super obvious? I mean, obviously, like it's just you have to see someone. If you're, right. they say they don't want to see glutes that are squared off. They don't want to see quads that are striated. Um, but if you're a smaller girl, I've seen a couple girls with striated quads in bikini. You know, so it's like, it, it's a smaller girl, right? So it's like it, she doesn't look too big, and for her, they like you know. So it's like it's every everybody, everybody has their own level of what looks good for them, and yeah. like you mentioned, try it, try it, and see, experiment. I know we've experimented like going softer going harder leaner smaller bigger yeah. so we you know we're we still trying to figure it out yeah but, uh, it's always an evol evolution. but we have a good idea um you know and i'm like i am one of those people that i can't get away with being too soft either you know that's never going to look good on me it doesn't look good at all so yeah. that's something we do know so you know yeah and that's funny is it because you kind of go too hard you go too soft and you just kind of find like yep. okay where do we got to be on this on this area and um, yeah, so it's, it is tricky, but the too muscular one, if you go into a posing class, if you go in and you send in like a physique assessment to like a good coach or something, like they should be able to tell you pretty easily. Mm -hmm. and, and, and really, if you go into a posing class and you go into a couple of them and you see all the bikini girls around you and you're clearly the biggest, like you're probably, and you're asking yourself, am I too big? You're probably right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like Ashley said. Yep. True, true. Okay. Next question. How do you plan out shows? Or decide what shows you're going to do. So for me, um, you know, I think like I sometimes will pick shows that have great memories attached to them. Like I'll probably do the Mile High for that reason. Not because we, you know, we don't even live in Colorado anymore. Well, I never did, but you don't <laughs> live in Colorado. <laughs> you I, like I acted third like of the year. I lived with you or something. <laughs> I never lived in Colorado, but I was out there all the time. Yeah. And people thought I lived out there. Um, but it has so many great memories attached because I remember that was my first show coming back. And that's one of the reasons why I'll pick a show. Sometimes I'll pick a show out of like convenience of location. Like, oh, I'm going to be on the East Coast of, of the USA all this week anyway. I might as well, you know, and whatever. Timing, of course. Like, am I already in shape? Or do I have to bust my butt just to get to this, just to make it for the show? Or like, am I just cruising, maintaining, and, and like seeing an opportunity for a show? Then I might do it if I'm feeling super motivated. And that's another thing, my mindset. Like, where's my mind at? Am I, like, motivated to compete? Do I want to keep going? Or do I want, to, want a little bit of a rest, I guess, um, is a good way to put it. But um, honestly, money doesn't really play into that. I never really look at what shows have the biggest payout. I don't. Like, I'm just like, oh, I, I don't even know really. Sometimes till like, they do the prizes. I'm like, oh, okay. You know. So, I don't know. <laughs> that's just how I kind of do it. How yeah. about you? Um, so when I pick a show for an athlete, it's usually based on where the, it's, it's always based on where they're at, like mm -hmm. conditioning wise. That's, that's literally always it. So yeah, that's, that's really it for me. So it depends on, so now the only time that that changes. And so just to get, give you guys a kind of a rule of thumb, if it's someone who is, let's say I know their physique already, they've done a couple shows and I'm like, okay, for you to nail your prep, you're for a nail a show, you got to be. 22 inches on the waistline and now you're currently 25 well that's easy if we lose a quarter of an inch a week we're going to be we're out we're around 12 weeks out so what shows are around 12 weeks out right now that type of thing if it's someone who's more advanced and i have i have a 
decent amount of like girls that are going for a pro card this year. Well, then we basically finished last season and, and already knew what show we we're going into next year, which is usually we'll do the circuit. Like, and the circuit is essentially, you know, that's my busiest time of the year besides the Olympia, is July through the end of August. And it's like, okay, we're going to go after a pro card. Those are usually the shows I go after for pro cards is Universe in early July, then USA's, and then North Americans. And, and those are generally like, that's, that's early July, July, and August. So you get three national shows in a short time frame. You get three chances of getting a pro card, and then you're out. And if they're a master's, I'll generally start them with um, Universe as a master's, then master's nationals, which is in July, and then North Americans as well, which is in um, August, U usually. I don't even know the, the dates this year. Mm -hmm. Everything's all messed up now, but that's usually how it went. And, um, and so that's kind of how I target it for like, an advanced bikini athlete the year prior. I'm like, okay, you did good at this show. You won the overall, you won your class, whatever. We got to grow here, here, and here. We're going to work on that for five months. And then we're going to start prep for, you know, USAs. And I want you to be eight weeks out in May so we can start getting ready for USAs or whatever. Right. So that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of how the two, the two differences work. Yeah. I like doing clusters of shows. I find it so much easier, you know? Yeah. It is so much easier to, you know, just do a round of them because I'm, I'm really good at, like, not giving in to the temptation after a show. I'm really good at that. Like, oh, I'll pass on the cheat meal. Just give me a salad. Some people can't handle it, though. Some people are, like, get off stage, and then they have a whole cheesecake and a pizza, and then, then well, well, I guess they can't do next week's show. Yeah, exactly. But for me, I'm, I'm like, oh, no, I'm fine. Protein bar, salad, I'm good. Yeah. Just give me some sleep. And then, you know what, let's go, going into the cluster thing real quick, there's, there's two different types of competitor, I think, that should be looking at how they should be doing shows. So if you're an Ashley type who's kind of always in the zone, has enough muscle, doesn't need to really make too much improvements, more so than anything, it's like just getting on stage and and doing and competing in general, then it so that's two different types, right? Now for Ashley, she could do cluster or she could do all year. It doesn't, you know, really change things that much for her because she doesn't need to do a whole bunch to her physique to get to the next level. She's already at the highest level. So now, if you're someone who's, let's say you're an ectomorph, you're real small body type, most, real small bone structure, and you just love competing and you have to put on some more muscle still, but you're in love with the sport and you want to compete as much as you can, you're going to probably take a lot longer to excel because you're always in like an extreme caloric deficit. You can make improvements on a caloric deficit. I've told you, I've said this before, you can build muscle, but it does limit you. It does, it is, it is incrementally harder the farther of a deficit you are in to put on any muscle, right? So you have to weigh those two out. Okay, how much improvements do I need to make? Um, do I need to make nine months worth of improvements? Okay, maybe you should pull back on shows, do three shows in three months, two months, and then work on improving and then do a show again a year later, nine months later. That's what I would recommend for those types. And then if I have girls that are just like need to eat away at muscle, let's just keep competing. <laughs> like, let's just keep it competing. You know, your legs are too big, might as well diet you down. Mm -hmm. Might as well keep that cardio up and let's just keep competing. Why not? You know, so... Different for different people. Yeah, you can definitely start to look better after doing so many shows. And, you know, it depends on who you are. Some people just go really flat. Depends. Yeah. Um, next question. How do you deal with low energy close to a show? Ooh, good one for you. Yeah. So <laughs> I deal with that one sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, sometimes it can be really draining close to a show. Because you're basically just, you know, running on E. And you're in a calorie deficit. Um, but, you know, I like to just think, like, you know, I'm feeling kind of crappy now, but when I get on stage, it's going to be worth it, you know? Um, but that also depends on how you prep, too, because you don't always have to have low energy. Like, we like to have our peak weeks, for example, kind of just, like, coasting into the yeah. peak week. Usually peak week is the easiest week for us. It's, like, just time to, like, chill, let the body de-inflame, deflame <laughs> and you know kind of just work more maybe on posing or something more like that it's not going to be the most intense workouts or anything but some people that do push it till the end you know totally understand energy is not there just think of the end goal i would say yeah. push through think of the end goal there you go mm -hmm. yeah enjoy the enjoy the suck and that's the thing about peak week too like where she talked about the peak week is i really do try to have the simplest most basic peak weeks and just so, because it's so predictable, you're not doing all these manipulations and then you don't know the end result. I don't have huge variances from people, from person to person on peak week. 
And I've been very successful at doing that. It's just like, oh, she needs a little bit more carbs, have her eat a little bit more carbs. Oh, she needs less, have her eat less. It's like basic as that. Like there's not all these crazy sodium things and water things. It's just like you get more, you get less. You should have been in shape. We don't we want to be have a predictable outcome of the end of this week and not throw all these crazy things at it. And I want them to be rested and recovered and feeling good and looking vibrant, which is a big part of bikini because we are trying to look like fitness models. You can't be all sucked down with you know, your cheeks looking all gaunt and dehydrated, all stringy on stage. Like, it's not the look of bikini. Like, you don't want to crush it all the way through. Um, so that's that's the reason that we do that kind of week, so. True, true, true. I love peak week. Yeah. Peak week's where I get my nails done and pedicure, my hair done. I do some pampering. Yeah. That's for sure. I like your Olympia <laughs> peak week because we do our nails together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every year. Did we do it this year? No. That sucks. Yeah, We've done it every year besides this year. Yeah. Heck, Adam. I think I dropped the ball on that. I'm, I'm going to find a new coach now. <laughs> You're fired. Yes. A coach that'll do his nails with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, next question. What do you like most about competing? It's a loaded question. Huh, I would say for me, it's like the memories. Like, I have so many great memories that I can look back on and be like, oh, I remember that time. And the way I felt after the show or... You know, I was so proud of myself that day. Or, I, you know, I, I surprised myself in a good way. So I love the memories attached. And also, it's, like, built a very um, good career for me, which I wouldn't have had if I didn't compete. So thank you, competing. And thank you, Adam. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I would say, for most part, memories. The memories. Yeah. I would, like, I'd be bored without competing. <laughs> for, me, for me, I would say, uh, when I did compete, I don't anymore, when I did, it was, especially the very first time, like when you walked off that stage, that feeling of accomplishment. I don't know if I've ever felt that besides then, to be honest. Like, you know, and I've, we've, in hockey, like we placed in world, you know, like the, the, that was still like, I did that, you know, like I went through it, I suffered and like, and it applies to everything in life. And I think that was the same, the same thing, that feeling of accomplishment every time you stepped on stage and like, it's just, it's cool to know you put yourself through that and like, you can handle pretty much anything, you know, at that. I don't know. I really like that part about it, to be honest. The competing itself, it's like, I don't really care where I place. It's just a matter of, you know, of like just being your best, being the best you, like knowing that you're your best you, mm -hmm. like, and you put everything into yourself. Like, that's pretty rare to be able to like, I don't know if there's anything else in life where you could really do that, where you're like, I know for sure I put everything into this for 16 weeks. I left nothing on the table. I am the best version of myself I could be today. That's pretty powerful, Yeah. you know? And it's kind of cool, too, that you're on stage wearing small clothing, <laughs> and you look better than 99% of the population. Like, very few people can say that they did what you did. Yeah. And it's, like, kind of crazy if you think about, like, in perspective of, like, just a normal person versus what you did to get to the stage, you know? You went above and beyond, some people work out like twice a week and think that's like yeah. a lot of work for the gym. But you did more than that, <laughs> way more, and diet. So it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool to think you're just a small percentage of the people that were able to pull it off. Yeah. Regardless of your placing. So pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, so what are some good exercises for a glute ham tie-in? I would say, honestly, that's going to go pretty far. So I would say watch the video we just posted on YouTube and IGTV for like the best exercises. But um, for the glute tie-in, surprisingly, a lot of the tie-in comes from, there's, there's weird things about the tie-in. So the, where the tie-in lies, you got to think about that. So what's really funny, I'll give you an example because I can show you it. So there's, there's like separation between the bicep and the tricep and the body will just try to get that separation, right? And they're like, how do I get that separation? Well, yeah, you got to build your bicep and tricep, but there's also a muscle that's under the bicep and tricep, which is called the um, bicep radiobrachialis, which basically goes, it's like uh, that muscle that's like on your forearm and it goes under the bicep and tricep. So if you work out that muscle, it's going to be under, right under the line of the bicep and tricep and helps create a little bit more kind of push up, push out of those two muscles. And it helps create that roundness and separation of those two muscles, right? So people don't think about like the anatomy and kinesiology of like a human and how to get this to show more. Well, where does the glute tie in? Where does that go, right? Well, that goes right on top of the hamstring origin, 
right? It's right, the, the glute tie-in is right on, t right on top of the hamstring origin. So the hamstring origin is, is under the glute tie-in at that part, right, on the, on, the, on the femur. So with that, yeah, it makes sense that if I were to get my hamstring bigger, it would push up the tie-in more and make it more exposed, right? But people don't think about it. They're just like tie-in, tie-in, tie-in only, right? They don't think about, okay, what do I got to do to get that to show, right? So surprisingly, a lot of hamstring exercises will help with that tie-in to pop in a little bit more on that glute tie-in. So yes, you got to work that glute tie-in, but you got to work the supporting muscles under it too. It's basically, you're building a house on a foundation and you got to build that foundation. So we found a lot of Ashley's activation was higher with doing lying hamstring curls in the key areas that we needed it to be for her glute tie-in to show up. And then of course we do isolation exercises on that glute tie-in too, but we needed the foundation there. So right. there and we did the sensor. So the sensor said it was the lying hamstring curl. Yeah, for her. I thought it would have been like an RDL or something like that. Because, I, you know, exercises where you feel it like under your butt cheek. Yeah. But it was lying hamstring curl. So. Yeah, for you, you had the highest activation. Now, all of them do, and some might be better for that specific part of the tie-in. But you got to build everything around it. You can't just do the tie-in. So um, everyone's going to be a little bit different based on, like, how their, their postural alignment, um, you know, how their how – their, Posture is you could have an anterior pelvic tilt, neutral spine, posterior pelvic tilt. Those people are all going to respond to exercise differently in that key area. And so one of the things you're going to have to really do is align yourself, you know, structurally, um, and then and then kind of feel it. And I usually I'll say the area you feel it the most is generally the best for that specific area. But think about the supporting muscle groups under it too, which is a little bit technical, but. Mm -hmm. Um, any good coach can put together a program for you that would be specific to your physique. And that's like one of the reasons why here we have all the coaches work in the office. We all collectively kind of come up with these solutions and try to collaborate to the, and, and create, you know, the best we can programs like for stuff like that. So it's, it does get a little bit crazy to try to like fully identify which ones are best. And that's why there's no, like, at this point, if there was one that was like an ironclad, this is the best for this, like you'd have a list. Like there'd be a list. Oh, no matter what, this is the best. It'd already be out there. But it's not like that. You know, it's it's definitely person to person, you know, alignment to alignment, you know, neuromuscularly to neuromuscularly, person to person is going to be a little differently. And you got to look at that person and say, okay, this is what she needs. This is what we're going to do the programming. We're going to spend six months on this program specific to this increased volume, whatever, to try to turn her into, you know, this wonder woman, you know? So it's a loaded question, but that's that gives you some good kind of thought process that goes behind it. What he said. <laughs> How to increase calories after being in a deficit. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, I know you are a big believer, or I, sh I shouldn't talk on your behalf, but you like <laughs> to you like to get people to maintenance pretty much right after a show. Like, yeah. I don't think you do the gradual, okay, I'm, this week I'm going to add 100 calories, then 100 calories... And then get to, you just go right away, correct? So, yeah. So that's been an evolution of mine as a coach too, which is crazy because it's been years and years of trying to, you know, reverse people, if you want to call it that. So the first problem is when reverse dieting came out, when it was named like reverse dieting. Um, so I'll give credit to Lane Norton here, who's an awesome, amazing, um, you know, nutrition scientist. And what I will say is he came up with the term reverse diet. I'm pretty sure he came up with it. And I think it's just in the verbiage of what he used, people just thought, oh, I, then I need to reverse my diet, just like I started. And people took it like for what it was on paper, how he, how he said it, but he didn't mean it like that. He just meant it like, it, so, but everyone thought, oh, I just do my diet and reverse. But he just meant it so everyone could understand, like in layman's terms, I got to increase my calories and there's a strategic way of doing that. And that's, but then it got taken too far, just like everyone hears one piece and just, they probably listened to one part and then just started reversing what they did. And they're like, oh, that's how I diet, right? Mm -hmm. Things have changed. So everyone pretty much collectively agrees that you should go to maintenance calories. The problem is, is that maintenance calories have shifted after a show. It's not where you started. It's different now, right? So if you started off eating 3,000 calories and you weren't lose, gaining any, or weren't, uh, and, so, and you weren't gaining any body fat at 3,000 calories, and then right after a show, you go right to 3,000 calories, you're probably going to gain a good amount of weight. So um, you got to understand that's always a shifting. It's always shifting with what you're doing. So if you've been dieting for six months, yeah, you're not going to be burning the same calories where you started. It's going to be a big shift. Now, why is there that initial weight gain, right? There's a lot that goes into that initial weight gain that can't really be proven by science. And there's another doctor, um, Jacob Wilson, who's another amazing guy, probably the guy that um, like 
I admire the most in nutrition science because he's more real. He's more, he's not so rigid. He's very like, this is possible even if we can't prove it. And that's kind of how I am. I'm like, I know things are possible that I haven't seen proven because it's the human body's nuts. And that's why it's taken me 20 years to realize I don't know anything. And it's like, it's like, wow, that's cool. Cause if I looked at only studies, it would say that this doesn't make sense. Right. But, but Dr. Jacob Wilson, he's a little bit more like, okay, someone gained 15 pounds of body fat after a show, like within two weeks. And you say it's impossible. He's like BS because I've seen it. And I've seen it with people who weren't eating 15,000 calories worth of calories, 15 pounds of fat worth of calories. Right. And he's like, and I've seen it on DEXA scans, on this, on that, right? So there's something completely, completely different that happens with the body when it's been in severe caloric deficits with severe caloric expenditures. And there's like this huge disconnect between calories in and calories out, right? Something happens and we can't explain it by science. And so, too, like, I think we've mentioned a few times, the studies, even though people say the studies, the studies, this, they don't study competitors. Yeah. Like they're, it's not possible. They do like what? college kids they're gonna lie in yeah like they're yeah right yeah or just average people you know what i'm saying like yeah. they never researched competitors yeah get a, it's a whole another story get a college kid to stick to a diet for 16 weeks with yeah. no parties yeah and like, yeah, yeah i'm get, sure <laughs> yeah yeah i did it right and so the the reality is is that when you see these weird things happen so like in the the jacob wilson scenario he was saying i've seen people gain i, I don't want to quote him for words you can look it up I think he said like he's seen people gain 20 pounds of fat in like weeks, weeks periods after a show through DEXA scan. They weren't eating that many calories. It didn't make any sense. If you were to break down how much fat they gained versus how many calories they consumed, it wouldn't, it just doesn't make sense. Logically, it's not on, on paper. It doesn't make sense because 20,000 calories would be 70,000 calories in excess, right? That's how much of consumption past caloric burn, right? So it's 3,500 calories per pound. So 10 pounds would be 35,000, 20 pounds would be 70,000 calories. And that's after you consume your normal maintenance of 2,000 calories per day. It doesn't make any sense, right? So I haven't seen it to that level, but I've seen it to like, probably like 15 pounds, no problem. So the answer is, okay, you gotta find maintenance calories. You gotta understand you're, you're probably cut your carbs because that's the least necessary macronutrient. Carbohydrates are not essential. You do not need carbohydrates in your diet whatsoever. It's not optimal to not have any carbohydrates, you know, but it's not essential. You don't need them for survival. Okay. You have essential fats, essential proteins, essential amino acids, things like that. No such thing as an essential carbohydrate. So everyone says, I need carbs. I need carbs. Like they need it in their mind. They don't, they don't need it anywhere else. So uh, it's just something that they've convinced themselves they need. And they just didn't want to go through the suffering of not having carbs for a period of time, which is, you know, again, not optimal. So, all right, going into this pretty far, but this is important. Now, Maintenance calories have shifted dramatically from start to your finish of your show. Your carb sensitivity has shifted dramatically. You're going to be a lot more sensitive to carbs if you just take in and you go eat 3,000 calories and 2,000 of those calories are from carbohydrates. How are you gaining so much body fat when the calories don't make sense? I can't answer that question. I wish I knew. No one's been able to figure that out. And the people who actually will even accept that that is a possibility is even less. Even the top guys, a lot of them won't even accept that that's possible. They're going to be like, no, because calories, you need 70,000 calories to gain 20 pounds. I understand that. It doesn't make sense what's happening, but it happens all the time. So what, do you, what my best solution for this has been so far, and I'm giving you out some big secrets here. My Don't tell anybody. <laughs> is sign up with me. <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> that'd be so good. <laughs> I couldn't handle the volume. No, the, the, the best thing that I've been able to do is to increase calories to what I presume is maintenance calories by overshooting protein by a dramatic amount. Why do I overshoot protein by a dramatic amount? Do I know people are eating too much protein when I do this? Yes, I'm not stupid. People are like, oh, you gave me too much protein after my show. Yeah. That was the point. I understand that you're not supposed to do that. I understand it better than you. But the reality is this. Protein is the hardest, is the absolute hardest macronutrient to convert to fat. It takes so much energy out of protein to convert it to stored fat, right? We're talking out of 100 calories, you're in the low 70s of how much protein can be stored as fat. So if I gave someone 10,000 calories from protein, at their best, they're going to be able to re maybe store 7,200 of those calories. So that's a huge benefit, right? If I can increase someone's calories dramatically and have a very low conversion rate of fat during their most sensitive time, why would I not do that? Does it add extra stress to the kidneys and liver by doing so much protein? 
a little. If I'm not overshooting it like crazy, it probably isn't going to have any effect on their on their liver enzymes and kidney levels and whatnot. So I take that calculated risk because it's better to have a very, very like minute, maybe none at all, slight elevation in those things because I'm eating too much protein, right? Versus a dramatic weight gain that has its psychological effects and prolongs future preps. So that's why I'll do that. I'll increase their calories to where I assume is maintenance. I'll, I'll increase it through protein. I'll try to have as lowest conversion of fat as I can. I try to keep them as lean as I can for a couple weeks after the show by when I'm increasing protein. And then after they check in, they're still checking in. It's super important that they're still checking in for a period of time because that's the most critical stage of their show is the post-show diet. And I don't call it reverse so people don't get confused. I call it post-show diet just to eliminate that confusion. But it is essentially exactly what Lane was talking about, just you know, increasing calories to maintenance, reverse diet. It just got labeled kind of, you know, people took it the wrong way. So um, I'll increase it. I'll make sure their measurements don't go up dramatically and then I'll find those calories and then I'll increase, I'll keep increasing calories. So let's say I overshoot protein by whatever, 100 grams, which is a lot to overshoot by. But remember what we're trying to do is increase calories here. And let's say I give someone, I don't know, let's just make it easy. I give them 2000 calories and out of those 2000 calories, um, a thousand of it is protein. That'd be 250 cal- 250 grams of protein if a thousand of it was protein, right? For a female, that's way too much protein. No reason she needs that much besides this scenario. Okay, so now I want to get her calories at 2,000. I want to get her, you know, her body's getting used to eating 2,000 calories now. And now I just decrease the protein and increase the carbohydrates to that same 2,000 calorie amount. And there's a lot less happening in terms of fat gain when those carbohydrates are introduced. It's like you, you, there's something that's happening where you will decrease her sensitivity to that high calorie input. Then they get used to that calorie input and then you can add in the carbohydrates and they pay almost no price for it. Versus if I just increase calories through carbohydrates, for some reason, you're paying a higher price. Mm-hmm. Now, in terms of conversion, carbohydrates um, are easier, more easily converted. I think it's like in the 80s, the high 80s. I think it's like 86 or 84 calories per 100. Don't quote me. It's in there somewhere. Don't quote them. Don't quote them. It's 86 to 100 can be stored as fat. So a lot, lot lower, uh, a lot higher of a price than protein in terms of conversion of fat. And fat is really easy to convert to fat. 98 out of 100 calories can be converted and stored as fat. So that's why I'll introduce that last. So then. Same process, right? You take down you take down carbohydrates and you increase fats. Make them less sensitive to that. Get their calories up. And then it's just a process of them checking in still, hopefully them not gaining any body fat, increasing protein, decreasing protein, increasing carbs, decreasing carbs, increasing fats, and keep slowly getting it up. Mm-hmm. But you start off right at what you think maintenance calories is, but through a protein amount. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that is... That is, my head is going to explode. That is my <laughs> answer to the post-show weight gain that no one can seem to get around even when they think they're at maintenance calories. And what I don't do, what I don't recommend, which everyone wants to do, is just gorge on food and then go through that initial 15-pound weight gain that, that Jacob Wilson hasn't been able to figure out and no one really has, no one can explain why it happens. That's my way around it. So I say avoid that, be happy, keep your results. It's so important because you work so freaking hard to get there and it can go like that. That's how I think it's of so, it too. Such a price. It's like I worked so hard for this body. My body has done so much for me. I want to be good to it. I want to be kind to it. It's, it's you know what I mean? 16 weeks, I can promise you, one week of just eating a little bit bad after a show when you're in that state, lost easily. I've seen it happen hundreds of times. Two weeks for sure. If they're eating like just like, oh, just do this now, I'll do this now. And I'm just oh, going out with my friends, eating pizza, having drinks, whatever. And I'm like... I get it. You know, we want to be normal. We want to be back to balanced or whatever your your normal is, right? You want to like feel less restricted, but you're paying such a high price right now. You know, you're paying such a tax on that food that you wouldn't pay before if you just went through the stages of correcting your yourself and being in the right like state with your carb sensitivity, insulin sensitivity and and calories up. Like you're just you're it's just it doesn't even I don't even know what the price is. It is definitely definitely different per person. Now, again, if it's a scenario where I have someone with the highest amount of calories, lowest amount of cardio, and it's not that crazy of a situation, they're going to pay a lot less of a price than someone who is doing like fish and tilapia only two hours of cardio. Those are the girls especially that you see really blow up after a show because they can't introduce anything. And it's like they weren't eating anything to begin with. Any calories are introducing a a nightmare scenario, you know? So there you go. So in summary, if you are looking to dive in to a post-show diet, it's more beneficial to have a protein-heavy diet rather than 
carb heavy or fat heavy. Yeah, you pay less Calories of a price. Calories more from protein rather than the other macros. It's, it's, yeah, you pay less of a price. You know, you're getting less insulin spikes from the protein. Um, it's just, you're in, it's a, just for the state that you're in, that's the one time I'll go off of the, off of the books and I'll be like, okay, I understand you're supposed to eat way less protein, but I want to give you a little bit of protein. Now I never go to the dangerous amounts of protein. People are always like, oh, it's too much protein. And I'm like, well, too much protein is very different per person. You know, I know a, a pro men's physique guy, he can only eat fish, he eats chicken once a week because his kidneys are so bad and he eats a very low protein diet because of that problem. For him, too much protein is way different than for me. I can eat a ton of protein, and then I check my, my levels on my, on my labs, and it's not, almost no effect, mm -hmm. right? So it's different. Too much protein doesn't mean you're dying because you ate 100 extra grams of protein. Like, oh, he ate too much of a protein. It's going to shut down his kidneys. Like, it's, it's you know. They're so dramatic. They're so dramatic. Like, no, because this guy said, this nutrition scientist, I'm like, oh, this nutrition scientist who's never won a pro show in his entire life, that guy said, that's who you're taking contest prep advice from, mm -hmm. you know, who's never even, like, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It's, you know what? That's, I, that's pet peeve is like when people are like doomsday people <laughs> like oh you know energy drinks you could die from that right Man. you know like yeah because one person two people died of it because yeah. they already had a heart condition and had it like it'll be something like that or like too much caffeine you know what i mean <laughs> or you know too much vitamin d you know be careful be careful it's like yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's there's bigger fears in this world. Yeah, <laughs> like everything in moderation. You know, oh, gosh. Oh, anyway. Yeah, rant. <laughs> rant yeah. Over. I'm glad. Oh, yeah, I like that. Right. That's a good one because it's so it's so it's so common. But um, yeah, it's uh, wow. It's so, been, been over an hour. Has it question. really? That, well, that one was. <gasps> I didn't do so good on that one. That one was no, a little. That quick. was good. It was education, although. No, it's we, important. We People don't know this. Ended on a very powerful. I feel like that one's gonna get a lot of traction. If you Too guys, bad we put it at the end. Yeah, if you guys, you better uh, clip that part. <laughs> if you guys learned a little bit, have questions about that. Now, I will say that is not a supported scientific theory in terms of research. Okay, that is just practical application. I've done this twenty years, guys. Like, I've learned a lot, and it's honestly, I learned more on the athletes I work with than I learned ever in schooling and books and anything. Like, it's just reps, you know. Right. And that just seems to be what works really, really good. I've switched that over the last like two years now. And um, it's been incredibly successful comparatively to the, all the phases of what I've been through. I went through the slow bring calories up slowly. I went through the whole, oh, they got to go to maintenance right away. And then I went through this. And then I, I've been through other things in there too to try. But this has been super successful for me. I think it's super important. If you're a coach, I don't care if you steal this from me because nothing is more important when you have someone who's in this, you got to understand the people we're working with, right? They are super body conscious. You wouldn't get into this sport unless you were super body conscious. So with that comes a lot of people who are hypersensitive about how they look. And if you're one of those people, that's okay. I am too. I'm a mess when it comes to how I look. When I'm not in shape, I hate taking my shirt off. Like I, everyone goes through this, right? It's okay. Like there's the community that we're in is all like that for the most part. You rarely have someone who's not like that in our community. We're all very body sensitive and our own worst critics and look at each other and pinch your waistline and like, oh, I a little feel fat today, right? We all have that. So understand coaches, when you're out there and you have an athlete who's doing a show and they finish a show and you just say goodbye to them and you're not doing a proper correctional diet, you're doing a huge disservice to them because when they leave, they might've looked great on the stage, but when they're at home and they're not having any guidance, they're not having this, this like, this isn't prepared for them, then they blow up and then they hate how they feel. Like they hate, they don't want to take off their shirt in front of the mirror. They don't want, they wear big loose clothing. They're going through a lot of like psychological harm where they just hate how they're feeling. And just a week ago, they, they felt on top of the world, best they ever looked, right? And it could just go like that. And that's why I'm so critical about it. And like coaches, steal that process. It works, you know, I don't care. If you're an athlete, steal that process. It works. So, I'm gonna you know, steal it. That's the best, that's, that's the best I've been able to come up with. Is there better ones? Yeah. Are there smarter guys than me out there than, yes. There's very few guys I would say are less experienced in terms of reps that, that have. I mean, I would say there's like five guys that have done this as long as I have at the level that I have with the volume that I have. And so, um, but yeah, do your own research. That works for me. There you go. Yes. He said everything. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, uh, hopefully you learned a thing or two from this week's episode of the Bikini in the Brain podcast. Next 
episode will be pretty special and we have a little giveaway you know for next episode. oh yeah oh you know what we gotta do that thing to this episode and next episode yeah because this one i'm sorry guys i'm walking up because i don't have oh. my phone with me all right guys sorry Woo. for you guys still listening thank you for hanging in there we are doing a muscle egg giveaway as you know muscle, muscle egg, egg is link in description link in description muscle egg sponsoring you get the team 10 percent off link in description 10 percent off but here's the thing <laughs> yesterday i put on an igtv post and i said anyone who tags anyone in the post of the IGTV with me and Ashley doing a glute workout video. So if you wanna see that five best glute exercises we did, we did it on YouTube or on, um, on Instagram and on YouTube. And we're gonna pick a winner now to give away a jug of muscle egg. But if you leave a comment in this video, we will, we will also put you in for next week's muscle egg giveaway, a full, Ooh. So you could just scroll through and any of these names that am you I, pick. I commented, am I allowed to pick myself? You're not. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. So I'm going to do like a blind scroll here. So there's no, whoever this person is. Who is this, Adam? Oh, okay. It's my eyes are closed, you're, guys. Well, you're in the middle of two. So one of these two, you're right in the middle. Um, The top one, whatever that one is. Okay. My eyes are still closed. The top one is Freedom in Motion 777. Woo! Freedom in Motion, you just won a muscle egg. Brandy Thompson, shoot me a DM. We'll get you some muscle egg. Thank you so much, you guys, for watching. Yes. Stay tuned for next week. More giveaways, more eggs. <laughs> Bye. Excellent.